Once again, the book of Hebrews is a book that was written for a group of God's people that has many parallels with us today. It was written at a time in the uh, mid to latter 60s A.D., probably around mid-60s A.D., just a few years before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Now, in the accounts in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, the parallel accounts, the question was put to Jesus Christ after he had talked about the fact of the temple being destroyed. You remember the story. The disciples uh, were there and were commenting on the grandeur and uh, impressiveness of the temple. And he told them that there would not one stone be standing there left standing upon another. And they were pretty shocked by that. And so they asked him the question as they got out privately on the Mount of Olives. They said, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. Now, clearly, they telescoped those events together. And it was only in uh, retrospect as time approached uh, that some of these things began to be understood. Peter uh, explained in the book of Second Peter some keys uh, to understanding uh, the fact that uh, uh, it was not yet the end of the age. Because it was, as... Uh, the writer of Hebrews wrote, uh, they were approaching a time, a time of crisis, a time of demarcation, something that, uh, that made a pivotal point in the history of the church. Because in the aftermath of 70 A.D., the destruction of Jerusalem, the cessation of the, the uh, Levitical services in the temple, all of these things, a time when the church was scattered, when the work as it had been uh, pretty well came to a close. A time when, uh, in the context of right around 70 A.D., most of that first generation uh, died. Uh, of course, they were, uh, by that time, approaching their 60s and 70s. And uh, uh, Peter, Paul, uh, and uh, James, the Lord's brother, and others uh, all uh, died within just a matter of three to four years uh, prior to, maybe even two or three years prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Paul is writing here in the book of Hebrews to a group of people who had been around, who had been in the church of God for a long time. They were individuals that uh, were, in many ways, had many parallels with us. Uh, they were approaching a time that many of them uh, anticipated as being the end time and uh, the destruction of Jerusalem as that uh, began to loom on the horizon and uh, it was obvious a crisis was brewing uh, there in uh, Judea and around Jerusalem and there was, you know, things were, were, were boiling and simmering. Now, they weren't exactly where they thought they were and it was explained by Peter in Second Peter uh, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation gave more details and gave an outline uh, of events that uh, put things in perspective. He was writing, uh, you know, a good 25 years or so after the destruction of Jerusalem. But there are many things in the book of Hebrews uh, that certainly parallel our circumstance and our situation today. And while there's something that we can gain a profit from every part of the Bible and every book in it, uh, there are some particular things in the book of Hebrews that uh, I think are good to focus on uh, and certainly have relevance for those of us who are living at this time. Now, Paul explains several things in the book of Hebrews. He focuses in on the role and the ministry, the continuing ministry of Jesus Christ. You know, Christ's ministry did not stop at the crucifixion. Christ's ministry did not stop at the resurrection. Christ's ministry did not stop at the ascension into heaven. Because what has Jesus Christ been doing for these centuries? Almost 20 centuries, 19, over 19 and a half centuries have transpired since Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven. 
Well, the book of Hebrews explains that. It was written to people who were very familiar. They had grown up seeing the, the Levitical services in the temple. They were familiar with all of the rituals and the sacrifices and all of the things that pertain to the Levitical service that was carried out in the temple. That was something that they'd grown up seeing. They'd attended the feasts there and all of these things. And Paul is explaining these things, explaining the real significance of what they'd seen because what they had been watching as an ongoing thing was going to cease in a matter of a few years, and that was not going to be the time when Christ was going to return. They were going to have to endure. They were going to have to be faithful over an extended period of time throughout their lives. Now, as Paul goes through and explains about Christ's ministry, his ministry in heaven, his ministry in the true sanctuary, which is in heaven, and the way that uh, Christ is our high priest, our intercessor, explaining the spiritual significance of all these things that they, they had seen, Paul then goes on and he explains, and we're going to note here in Hebrews chapter 10, because Paul explains not only about Christ's ministry, but Paul explains about our role and what it is that we need to be doing. And there's some very important things that are brought out here. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, For the law, having a shadow, a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, which law is he talking about? Well, he's talking obviously about the ritual law, the law that pertains to the sacrifices, the law that was a, that foreshadowed Reality to come. You see, the, the ministry of the tabernacle and the temple, the sacrifices, the washings, all of the rituals, those things illustrated spiritual truths. God didn't look down, you know, despite what some people may think, God didn't look down and copy the pagans. Uh, he didn't look down and see somebody, uh, uh, you know, having some sort of ceremony and say, well, you know, that's a pretty good idea. I think maybe we ought to do that. He didn't just tell the Israelites, well, look around and get some ideas. You, you saw the way the Egyptian priests did. And you saw, uh, you know, look around and see what the Canaanites are doing. See if you can come up with a few ideas and just sort of put your religion together and, uh, you know, worship me however you choose. And that's fine. No, God told Moses in the mount, He said, see that you make all of these things exactly according to the pattern that I showed you in the mount. You see, that, that, was, that was the key, that he was instructed to, uh, uh, to do that, that uh, uh, as it says in Hebrews 8, verse 1, Now the things of which we are spoken, of the things of which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is, ne it is necessary that this man would have somewhat to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, says he, this is a quotation from Exodus 25.40, See, says he, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to you in the mount. The things that were made on heaven, uh, that were made on earth, particularly the tabernacle that Moses designed in the wilderness, was an exact, it was based on a pattern of heavenly things. Christ, these things foreshadowed good things to come. They were not able, as it explains here in Hebrews 10.1, you know, there were sacrifices that they offered year by year continually, every year, day in, day out, morning sacrifice, evening sacrifice, special sacrifices on the Sabbath, special sacrifices on the new moons, special sacrifices on uh, the various uh, festival days, special sacrifices on special occasions. 
Continually. Every morning, every evening. They did it year by year continually and they were never able to bring those that participated to completion. It was never able to bring them to the point of being finished, of being becoming what they were designed to be. This word per, uh, perfect, it's, a, it's an interesting word. It was used uh, in, the, in the Greek language. The, uh, the, the sense is completion. And, and it was a, originally a word that referred to maturity, such as uh, uh, describing uh, fruit that is, that is completely ripe. And it came to be used in, in uh, the philosophical writings of the Greeks to, to describe something that was moving toward or, or reaching uh, a, a, an end, a, a purpose that was achieving or accomplishing uh, its, its purpose. Its, uh, uh, all of the energies and the efforts w- uh, were moving toward a specific, desired, uh, predetermined end or conclusion. There is an end, there is a conclusion, there is a point to which we are designed to move, and that is to becoming like God. Now, all of these sacrifices, all of these rituals, all of these things they went to, went through continually, day after day, for year after year, were never able to bring things to completion. Verse 2, for them they would not have, you know, they would have ceased to have been offered. Because the worshippers once purged would have had no more conscience of sins if sin had been paid for. It didn't have to be paid for over and over and over and over again. In those sacrifices, verse 3, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. They are reminded. They are reminded of sin, that they are sinners, that the wages of sin is death, that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. And they are reminded of that. It is not possible, verse 4, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So, as it comes on down, the, uh, um, it come, it, it, um, as we um, come on in verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. Uh, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. In other words, there was a there were physical patterns that preceded uh, that are to be uh, replaced by a spiritual reality, by the which will we are sanctified. We are set apart and made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. For the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. And after that he said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So he's setting the stage for something, as we're going to see here in just a moment. Christ paid the penalty once and for all. So, it is possible to have forgiveness and to be made clean. And therefore, it is possible to have direct access to God. The New Covenant involves putting the law in our hearts and in our minds. It involves a forgiveness and a removal of sin, verse 17. Under the Old Covenant, the way for sin to be removed was not available. They focused on the fact that there was a need. They focused on a a type There was a pattern, 
that was played out in the sacrifice of the animals, but I don't care how many animals you sacrificed, you could sacrifice every cow on the planet, and it would not atone for the sins of one person. But Jesus Christ came to pay that penalty in our stead. Now, as Paul goes through and explains this in detail to people who were familiar with the pattern and what they needed to understand was the reality that God uses types. God illustrates things. We see it in prophecy. That's why there is generally a historical fulfillment of many things that helps us understand the final end time reality and fulfillment. God works that way. He gives us an illustration that shows in a, in a, in a general way how something can be done. He, uh, he does that in prophecy. He does that with His, with his plan. He does that in the holy days. We go through certain things every, every year, the various festivals. They are descriptive and they are reminding us of various things. Now, of the plan and purpose of God. We are, we are reminded. You know, when you take the, the bread and the wine at Passover, you are reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We look back on His sacrifice just as, as the, uh, the Israelites of old killed a lamb and looked forward to that sacrifice. But the lamb couldn't pay the penalty for sin. The bread and the wine can't take away your sins. Those things are physical reminders. They're, they're illustrations. They are patterns that remind us of certain things. But there is a reality. Now, Paul is explaining this to these people. And then he goes on in verse 18. He says, Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. And he was in that sense pointing them to the fact that within a matter of a very short time, within a matter of just a few years, uh, there was no more, there were no more offerings made in Jerusalem. And that, I think, is, is significant in that way. Verse 19, having therefore, you know, as a result of that, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now you understand what this meant under the, the Levitical administration of the Old Covenant. The, in the tabernacle and later in the temple, there, were, there was a division. It was a room uh, similar to this. Uh, the back third of it, let's say, if we're going to uh, uh, use that, that uh, there would be a wall or a curtain across uh, that would go two-thirds of the way back. And so the room would be one-third and then two-thirds. And in the back one-third was what was called the Holy of Holies. And inside there would have been, uh, let's say from about the tables on back, uh, would have been uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Then in the front two-thirds of the room would have been the altar of incense, would have been the tables of showbread, uh, would have uh, uh, been the, uh, the seven-branched candelabra. The priests came and went on a daily basis into the holy place. The high priest alone went into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. There was a curtain that hung across that separated now, if you remember the account that when the, uh, at the time of Christ's death, the veil of the temple rent in two. Now, if you do a little reading on that, you find out that was a, that was a massive earthquake. And evidently there, there, were, there was a, uh, because this, this curtain was not, it wasn't just a little uh, thin sheet, you know, that, uh, uh, that it took. It was, it, was, it was heavy, it was thick, uh, it was a massive, uh, it was a massive curtain, and it was held up. There was a, uh, a beam made out of stone uh, that went across, that, that held this thing, and evidently the, the earthquake uh, actually broke. Uh, this uh, uh, this lentil that went across and it uh, and it ripped the uh, the uh, curtain in two, ripped the veil, and this 
uh, was uh, something that uh, was a uh, uh, was a major occurrence. In fact, it's sort of interesting. I, I don't know that uh, the historical records exist to prove it clearly one way or the other. But one uh, interesting thing uh, in this regard, and that is the fact that uh, uh, if something of this According to Jewish law, according to the uh, uh, the traditions that they uh, uh, administered, that for something of this to ha- uh, of like this to happen, uh, it rendered uh, the uh, it rendered the temple and the temple uh, precincts uh, defiled until it was repaired. And uh, if the temple and the temple precincts were defiled, uh, then uh, uh, there until it was uh, till the cleansing took place and all of this they couldn't offer uh, sacrifices everything was was considered uh, unclean until it had been cleansed and we're going to see a little bit of the what that foreshadowed here in just a moment but if that occurred if you look at the timing of it it's very possible that uh, the Jews were unable to offer the uh, uh, those who were waiting for the uh, lambs slain in the temple uh, on the afternoon of the Passover. Uh, very interesting uh, that uh, most likely that year they were actually unable to carry out the uh, uh, the service there in the temple on that uh, uh, on that afternoon because for something like that to have happened would have uh, would have put a stop uh, to that and uh, would have involved a, a ritual of, of cleansing that would have extended over a period of time. Uh, so uh, I think it's very I think it's very likely. I've done some uh, research on it. I would like to do a little more uh, to uh, sort of nail that down. But uh, you know, just sort of one more thing that pointed to the fact that there was one sacrifice for sins offered forever. And that was, of course, Jesus Christ. Now, the point is, we have access. You see, the Holy of Holies, in there was the Ark of the Covenant, and above the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. Coming into there symbolized direct access to God the Father. Direct access to God, to the very throne of God. The people were cut off from that access. Through the sacrifice of Christ, we have direct access. Now, what are we to have? Therefore, brethren, having therefore, brethren, boldness. Do we really value that access and do we come boldly before that throne of grace? By a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, You see, we as the church are the house of God where there is a high priest over the house of God, Jesus Christ. He has made possible direct access of every one of us. You remember Israel of old had the opportunity under the Old Covenant. They were given the opportunity uh, in Exodus 19 of becoming a nation of priests, a kingdom of priests. They violated the terms of the Old Covenant and never became that kingdom of priests. The Levites were then chosen out from Israel, and they were consecrated as priests to take the place of the firstborn of all the tribes. They served as a replacement. But we have the opportunity, we are called by Peter in 1 Peter, a royal priesthood. You see, the promise of the Old Covenant of that they would become a kingdom of priests, the promise of the New Covenant is that we become a royal priesthood. Now, the difference was God offered them, He offered them the law under the Old Covenant, and that was fine, but you see, the law isn't enough. They didn't ask for the help necessary to keep the law. They said, we'll do it. Well, they couldn't. And they proved the record over and over and over and over again that human beings, with the law and with the promises, still can't do it because if you don't have the power of God to enable you to transform you, The law tells you what you ought to do. The promises tell you what you'll receive for doing it. But human will isn't enough. But we have direct access. Now, let us draw near, verse 22, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, it's interesting what is made reference to here because he refers to a 
sprinkling of our hearts and a washing of our bodies. Now, what is that talking about? Does that mean you ought to sprinkle? No. The washing of the bodies is... is that's what happens at baptism. You, your body is immersed in water. But if all that happens is your body is immersed in water, that's not enough. You also have to have your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now, if you go back to Numbers chapter 19, you find out what that's talking about. You see, all of these things were foreshadowed. In Numbers chapter 19, verse 1, the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded us, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. You shall give her to Eleazar the priest. He may bring her forth out the camp and slay her before his face. And Eleazar shall take the priest shall take of her blood with his fingers, sprinkle of her directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. One shall burn the heifer in his sight. Her skin, her flesh, her blood, her dung shall he burn, everything pertaining to it. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. And then they wash themselves. And verse 9, A man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel, for a water of separation, it is a purification for sin. So, it goes on down that, um, that when something becomes defiled, uh, we find that uh, uh, in verse 17, for an unclean person, here's what happens when somebody becomes unclean, they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin, and running water shall be put thereunto in a vessel. In other words, water that came from a stream, flowing water. It typified rivers of living water, you see, which is God's Holy Spirit. So they took running water, and they took some of the ashes, and they put it together in a vessel. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it into this water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon the vessels and upon the persons that were there. That's where the sprinkling came in. Now, if you read there in Numbers 19, I don't want to go through all the details, they had to wash themselves and their clothes with water, but that was insufficient to remove the defilement, the uncleanness. That physically cleaned them up. See, if they come in contact with something, they were defiled. They took a bath, washed their clothes. All right, they're, they're clean, they're sanitary. But that was insufficient because... Physical defilement was used to illustrate spiritual defilement, that it excludes us from the presence of God. And so they took the ashes of a heifer, mixed it with running water, dipped hyssop into this vessel, into this mixture, into this water with the ashes dissolved in it, and they sprinkled that. All right, what do we have? We have, we're to draw near, verse 22 of Hebrews 10, in full assurance of faith. Confidence. You can come to God in a confident way. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Having the defilement of our thoughts, our heart, our attitude. Christ paid for our sin. The defiling attitudes and thoughts. That's ultimately the origin of sin. It starts in our mind. Our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Just as the sprinkling of the ashes mixed with water purified that which was ceremonially defiled that which is defiled. You remember Christ said when, when the Pharisees were making this big deal because the disciples ate with unwashed hands, uh, not having carried out the rituals of the, uh, of, and the traditions of the elders. Christ said it's not that which goes in that defiles a man, but that which comes out. He says these things come out of the heart. All of these evil thoughts and words and deeds. You see, the real defilement is not because you brushed against something 
Real defilement doesn't come from being next to a dead body. You may be, you know, that may you ought to wash your hands, you ought to wash and be clean. But some of those things mentioned in Numbers 19, physical sources of physical contamination were used as a type, as a shadow of spiritual contamination. And that is removed through Christ's sacrifice. So we can come before God boldly. Our heart has been sprinkled and our bodies have been washed. We have been immersed and in that sense have symbolized what must occur. We're told in verse 23, let us hold fast. See, verse 22 says, let's draw near. Verse 23 says, let's hold fast. The profession of our faith without wavering, for He's faithful that promise. Now, we're going to see that there are three specific things, verse 22, 23, and 24. Let us, let us draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider one another. Verse 24. There are three things that we are to do in response to what God has done. One is we're to draw near. We are to spend time with God. That's interesting. I visited a lady this week, uh, not in Louisiana. She was a lady that I had baptized a number of years ago in another church area. And, uh, you know, I hadn't had contact with her in a long time. And uh, she made contact. I talked with her on the phone and arranged to go visit her. And as my wife and I were sitting there and, and visiting with her, she mentioned something, because I, I know there was a time when, when she was uh, really uh, growing and going forward, and she had had various problems, and, and her life had really gotten messed up, and she had just was to the point that she wanted to start coming back to church, and uh, she knew some things that she needed to do, and she had really thought things through, and she, she said, you know, I remember several years ago that I noticed something. I noticed that I had calluses formed on my knees. And she said, at first I couldn't figure out why the, where these calluses were coming from. And then I realized that it was from being on my knees, praying, over a period of several years. And calluses had begun to, to form and to build up. And she said, you know, I noticed something recently. I don't have the calluses anymore. And... I noticed something else. You know, she, what she noticed was that her life had really gotten in a shambles. And in the context of that, she made a proper conclusion that the calluses had disappeared. She wasn't drawing near. She wasn't spending time with God. She got distracted. She got away from God. And her life began more and more to become unmanageable. Various problems began to come in. Old problems recurred, new problems came. And she recognized that she hadn't been drawing near. It was really, in fact, it was, I felt like very inspiring and encouraging to visit with her because it was almost like visiting with a brand new prospective member. Here was somebody who was really in the process of reclaiming her first love. She learned some valuable lessons. And uh, she was really intent on really drawing near to God. Paul tells, as he goes through all these things that were happening, these people were going to have their whole world turn upside down within a matter of three or four years. In that context, as Paul goes through and explains the spiritual significance of all the things they've seen around them, what Christ is doing today, he says, you know, there are things that we have to do. Let us draw near. Let's draw near. We have access into the Holy of Holies. We have direct access to God the Father. Even the high priest couldn't come before God except once a year on the Day of Atonement. We've got something that is unparalleled because it's made possible through our high priest, Jesus Christ. He made possible our direct access. We are to draw near. To draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Not coming before God timidly. Not coming before God, well, He's probably not listening and He probably won't do anything if I ask. To come before God 
with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's a tremendous benefit. And that is the key to everything else being able to work in our lives. If we're not drawing near with full assurance. See, we've been cleaned up. We can come near to God because we've been washed and cleansed spiritually. The defilement has been removed. And we can and are to come before God. To come before God in full assurance. Now, notice verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He's promised, He's faithful that promised. The next thing we are to do, we are to come boldly before God to draw near in full assurance. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. We have said that we believe certain things. We need to hold it fast. We need to be steady and constant in our obedience and service to God. We need to recognize the necessity of a spiritual stability. Uh, of uh, when you hold fast, if you if you hold fast to something, you're holding tight. You're not letting it go. To hold fast the profession of our faith, what we have acknowledged, what we have said, that we are called to live our faith. See, faith isn't just a matter. Well, I believe this and don't believe that. Faith is something that's to be lived. It's to be practiced. It's to be followed. We're to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You can hold fast without wobbling and vacillating because God is faithful and our faith is based upon God's promises. And so we can have confidence. God's going to do what He says. God's going to back up His Word. And we can hold fast the profession of our faith. And that's, you know, that's, that's an important... Uh, that, that's an important thing that uh, um, as, we, uh, uh, as we recognize that, uh, that uh, uh, notice what Paul told Timothy back in, the, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 11. He said, but you, O man of God, flee these things and follow after, pursue after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto you are called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. He said, you have... You have talked the talk. You have professed a good profession before many witnesses. People have heard you say what you believe. You professed it and you've said it right. A lot of people have heard you. You need to fight the good fight of faith. You need to lay hold on eternal life. Because you've been called to that. You professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now he says in verse 13, I give you charge in the sight of God who quickens all things, makes alive all things, and before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, a good profession, same word. See, Christ bore witness before Pilate and he lived that witness. That you keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, Paul explains here to Timothy that what we profess, what we acknowledge, what we uh, give allegiance to by our words. We are to live in our lives. We're to hold fast that profession of our faith without wavering. To seek to be constant. But you see, if you're not 
if you're not drawing near to begin with, if you're not drawing near to God to begin with, then you're not going to be able to hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering. Peter professed, you remember back before Christ was, was crucified? Peter said, Lord, I'll lay down my life for you. Though all men forsake you, I'll never leave you. You remember that? And Christ said, Peter, before the cock has crowed, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, oh no, I'll never do that. I will never let you down. I'll die first. Well, you remember the rest of the story. Peter got scared. Peter's faith failed. He did the very thing he thought he would never do. But do you remember the rest of that story? You remember there were a few hours that intervened between Peter's profession and Peter's failure. Those were the hours they were in the garden. Those were the hours Christ was praying and that He told Peter and James and John to watch with Him in prayer that their faith fail not. And they went to sleep. They were tired. It was late. They had had a big meal. And they probably prayed a little bit, but they dozed on off. Christ prayed with intensity. Intensity to the point that He literally sweat blood. They were snoring. Now, they weren't able to hold fast. Peter was not able to hold fast the profession of his faith without wavering. Why? Because he hadn't drawn near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. There's a lesson there for us. Peter learned his lesson. And when you go through the book of Acts, you read the way in which God powerfully worked through Peter. You know that Peter learned something very, very valuable that night. He learned that his strength was inadequate. If he relied on his strength, he would fail. And that's a valuable lesson. The whole story of Israel under the Old Covenant was they relied on their strength and their strength was insufficient. So let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let's hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. In verse 24, let us consider one another. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're to consider one another. To provoke unto love and good works. It's, it's interesting, this word provoke in the Greek is very similar to the word provoke in English. It's nearly always used in a negative context. You know, what, what happens when you talk about somebody provoking one another, uh, or provoking somebody, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, them stirring it up, and nearly always we use the word in a negative context. Uh, you know, two kids getting a scrap. Well, you know, he, he provoked it. He just sort of stirred it up and, and incited it. The word is elsewhere. This is the only place in the New Testament that's used in a positive context. It's, uh, uh, but it says we're to consider one another. We're to be. We're to think about one another. Now you and I can't control the actions of each other. We can't control the outcome. We can't control someone else's feelings and their actions. But we can all have an influence. We can all have an influence with each other. And we should. It's interesting, this lady was we were visiting was talking about, there, there was a group of several uh, young women around the same age uh, that I baptized uh, in this other church area uh, at uh, uh, somewhere around the same general time period. And they, they, there, were, there were several of them. They were good friends. They communicated with one another. Uh, they encouraged one another. And they brought out the best in one another. They encouraged one another's faith. And there was a time when they were going and, going and going forward in that way. But various things came in and things got off track. And I, uh, she was sort of recounting the story of various things. One of the things that occurred, there was a time when they were provoking one another to love and to good works. 
And that's something that we ought to think about one another in terms of what can we do to bring out the best in each other. You know, how do you influence other people? Primarily, two ways that I know of, by your words and your actions. We all influence each other. We have, you know, some of us, maybe depending on the amount of time we spend, we can have more or less influence. Sometimes it seems in the churches and elsewhere uh, that people put a period here in the middle of the verse. Let us consider one another to provoke. And, and so we find that people provoke one another. Uh, the, the love and good works gets left out. They just provoke. And uh, people get stirred up. They get their feelings hurt. And they get mad at so-and-so. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, things are said that shouldn't be said. We need to consider one another, to think about one another, to bring out the best, to provoke unto love and good works. Now, you don't provoke somebody to love and good works by coming up and chewing them out and telling them, you need to get on the stick or you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to fry. Well, they may be provoked, but they're probably not provoked to love and good works when you finish that. You, how do we... Words bring out the best in you. What makes you feel like responding with love? What about when love is extended to you? When you're shown love, when you're shown kindness, don't you feel like responding in kind? You know, somebody comes up and jumps on you and chews you out and tells you all kind of bad things about yourself. Uh, is your first response... What, 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 what is that? You know, is that some, is that positive? Is it helpful? I'm not saying that there's not a place for correction. There's not a place to, to speak straight with one another. But there has to be a relationship that exists to where what is said comes from a loving brother or sister and it can be taken that way. We provoke to love and good works by our example. You know, you set an example, you do something. Others see that example, and they are encouraged to do it. We, you know, it's, the principle applies that uh, we we join together on something. We we do something. You know, it's interesting. You put, uh, uh, let's say, we we have maybe a project. Maybe we're going to have a work party or a work project, and uh, an announcement is made on it. You know. As people begin to talk it up, well, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be there. Well, that provokes others who may thought, you know, I really don't want to be up at that time of the morning. And uh, but you know, they get stirred up on it too. We can bring out the best in one another by setting an example and by positive conversation, by focusing in on things that are going to lead to love and to good works. The kind of love that God is talking about is the love that is the fulfilling of the law. It is the love that is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. It is the very attitude and nature of God Himself. It's the kind of love that's prepared to lay down our lives for one another because that's the love that Christ had and that's the love that He said we're to love one another as He loved us. By our words and our actions. You see, the key is we have to consider one another. None of us lives or dies to ourselves. Our example impacts others. We can discourage people's faith. We can encourage people's faith. We can bring out the best in others and we can bring out the worst in others. We're not, we can't take responsibility for all the choices that others make because we don't have control of those choices. But we all are in a position to influence. We're in a position to influence. And we're not to, uh, to take that lightly. So he says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. In both aspects, you see, the good works are to be motivated by love. Love isn't just a feeling or an emotion. Oh, I love everybody. To say nice things, but never help, never serve, never do not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. There were those who were isolating themselves. You know, there are various reasons why some forsook the assembling together. They may have been afraid of persecution. 
Uh, there were problems, and you know, as things are, were that way. Uh, they may have been afraid of persecution. They may just have been spiritually lethargic and, and figured, well, you know, I don't know. I've heard all this stuff. Others may have been mad at somebody. You know, that that can happen. They get stirred up. Well, I, you know, I, I just don't like to be around where so and so is. Whatever it was, there were obviously some had gotten into the habit of just simply not assembling together. Now, how can you provoke to love and good works if you're not with the brethren? How can you be a, how can you make a positive contribution in the lives of others if we isolate ourselves from each other? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, talking to one another. You know, there are things that doesn't mean you come up and you 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 just tie into somebody and start telling them all the things they ought to do. But you know, if you're having a conversation and if you're uh, being open and, and, and talking with one another, talking about the sermon, talking about maybe things that you've gone through or that you've uh, been studying in that sense, to exhort one another. To, it means to, to you know stir up one another in terms of prayer, in terms of, uh, of uh, studying God's Word, living God's way of life. You know, there's a wide variety of things in the Bible to study. But ultimately, the emphasis has to come back that we have to be taking and applying in our lives what we're learning. Because what we're called to is a way of life. What we're called to is to become like God. The administration carried out under the Old Covenant was not able to make those that were the participants perfect. It was not able to bring them to what they were designed to be. But God has a plan and a purpose that's being worked out in your life and in mine. God is making something out of us. God had a design and a purpose in mind before the world began. God is reproducing Himself. He's adding to His family. Our destiny is to be born into that family at the resurrection. All of the things that went before, their patterns, their illustrations that are used throughout the Scripture to help us grasp and understand what God is working out. But we have a tremendous benefit. We have available to us information that was never before really seen or understood. You know, we're we're told that, that... uh, uh, the things that uh, uh, you know, the things that we have, and the things that uh, uh, we have access to, that there were many righteous men that desired to look, and to the things that we have that we can know, because Christ came as the messenger of the new covenant with the good news of the kingdom of God, and He explained and expounded the whole purpose of God more fully than it had ever been shown before. He expounded the reality. So, Paul explains here that we have direct access to God and so we need to draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We need to utilize that access and come to God to come with Him, to come to Him in boldness and confidence to utilize that access day in and day out. Because we have that access that the blood of Jesus Christ made possible. We need to hold fast what we've laid claim to. We need to, with steadiness and stability, Hold on to what we've said, to what we've acknowledged, what we've professed. That we live it in our lives, but we have to be close to God and walking with Him to be able to do that. And we need to consider one another, to think about one another, to realize that our lives have influence on one another. We can't afford to isolate, to draw back, to to get in, in little cliques and... All of these things. These pressures are going to be on us. 
they just are, brethren, and, and, and we have to realize that. These things are here, and as the times of crisis drew on to the people of God, we, we have to be aware of that. And so, to consider one another, to bring out the best in each other, to provoke to love and to good works. How do you provoke to love and good works? By setting an example of love and good works. By the things that we say and the things that we do. We can set the example in our actions and we can by our conversation, by our words, try to encourage, try to upbuild, try to help, try to focus in on the things that are good and right and helpful and positive. You know, Philippians, Paul tells us in Philippians that uh, he says, in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Having our minds set on what is good and right and wholesome, what is positive and upbuilding, Utilizing the opportunities we have, not forsaking the assembling, but so much the more as we see the day coming, to utilize our opportunities, to stimulate one another, to stir up one another, to talk about the things of God, to encourage one another in our trials and our adversities, to be concerned about one another, to love one another, to help one another, to spend time with one another in that way considering one another not just having an isolated well you know I'll do what I do and and what I do doesn't affect anybody else well yes we all we're members one of another our lives are intertwined and they if we're all going to be in the family of God they're going to be intertwined for eternity aren't they so we want to consider one another to think about each other as to how we can try to bring out the best to provoke to love and to good works. And not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So Paul goes through and he explains that and talks about the the things that are to come. Rehearses the men and women of faith and the examples that they set. Brethren, we are living through times that are going of which the generation that received the book of Hebrews, what they went through in seeing the destruction of Jerusalem was a type. It was a type of a future reality of what many of us are going to see and experience. You see, the destruction of Jerusalem in that day did not set the stage for the return of Jesus Christ. But when you read Zechariah 14, you find that there is yet a future Destruction of Jerusalem. The city will be taken. The houses rifled. The women ravished. Then shall the Lord go forth. And you read how in that day His feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives. Jesus Christ really is going to come back. What they went through, the events of their lives that culminated in that destruction, was a type. It, in many ways, foreshadowed the end time. It foreshadowed the events of the tribulation, and of all of these things. Paul told them in that context the things they needed to be conscious of. Christ has an ongoing ministry. We need to avail ourselves of that by drawing near to God, holding fast the profession of our faith, and considering one another to bring out the best in one another. To draw close to God and to draw close to one another.